Let me uh, lead us in prayer, and then we'll come and look at God's word together. Our Heavenly Father, uh, we pray now that you would be with us as we consider your word. Help us not to be hearers only. Help us to be doers. We pray that you will give us a wisdom, that we would understand our trials, our sufferings in your way. We pray that you'd help me to preach your word faithfully. And we pray that you would help us to have a greater appreciation of who you are, the gracious and good God. Help us, Lord, to know you and love you and trust you in every circumstance of life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what difference does Jesus make to your suffering? What difference does Jesus make to your suffering in a fallen world, we'll inevitably face times of suffering. We may go through a painful breakup in a relationship. We may have stress at work. We may have conflict at home. Uh, we may worry about our finances. We may get sick uh, or lose a loved one. Uh, we'll suffer as Christians too, of course. We may be marginalized. We may be misunderstood or uh, by our parents. We may be slandered by non-believers. We may even be physically harmed for our faith. What difference does Jesus make to how you face all of those trials? Uh, when you suffer, are you just like the people around you? Uh, are you thrown into anxiety and despair? Uh, do you get angry at God? Are you paralyzed by grief? Or does your knowledge of a sovereign, good, gracious God make some difference? Uh, does it give you perseverance? Does it give you joy? Does it give you hope even as you go through the pain? What difference does Jesus make to your suffering? Well, today we begin this new series on the book of James. Uh, you'll see we've entitled the series Undivided uh, because James's chief concern as he writes this letter is to convince us to be undivided Christians, not just to be Christians on the outside, but to be truly Christians on the inside. He knows it's very easy to be a Christian only in name, but not in substance. So you do the Christian things, you know, you come along to church, you get baptized, you attend your discipleship group, maybe you even serve in some ministries. But actually, when you compare your life to the non-believers around you, there's really not that much discernible difference. Priorities, our speech, our temper maybe, our desires, well, they're just like the people around us, really. Christian on the outside, but worldly on the inside. James wants us to be undivided Christians. Not double-minded, not hypocritical, but thoroughly changed from the inside out. Now, you may know that the letter of James has been quite neglected over church history. Martin Luther famously called the book of James an epistle of straw because uh, as you read through it, you'll notice it lacks a lot of the deep theological reflection that we see in some of Paul's letters maybe. Uh, in fact, the name Jesus is only mentioned twice in the whole of the letter. Uh, the first one is in the opening verse. Uh, he doesn't talk in depth about the atonement or many of the other big themes uh, in the New Testament. Uh, and if you read, if you don't read what James is saying carefully, you may even think that he's contradicting what other authors in the Bible say, like Paul's teaching on justification by faith alone. We just learned about that in the solas. The kids are learning about it today. Some think James says the opposite. But that's just because we haven't read James carefully enough. Of course, James believes in the death of Jesus. Of course, James believes in justification by faith alone. Of course, James believes in all that good theology that we hold on to. It's just his purpose is different, you see. James's great aim is not to give us more theology to puff up our heads. He wants our theology to change our life. He wants us not just to believe in Jesus, but to live out our belief in Jesus, to have our lives changed by what we believe. And so in chapter 1, verse 22, he says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Or in chapter 2, verse 17, he says, Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Or in chapter 3 and verse 13, he says, The wise life is to be seen in our good conduct. Or in chapter 4, verse 8, he says, Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double 
minded. You see his point? He wants us to have an undivided faith. He wants us to be single-minded. He wants what is on the outside to match what is on the inside. Not hypocrisy, not double-mindedness, but a loving God with a whole heart with all of life. And in particular, as he opens the letter here, he wants us to be undivided in trials. He wants us to have a distinctly different perspective on the sufferings we face in life, a a perspective that is really like Jesus. Well, who is James? Uh, James introduces himself simply enough in verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, presumably he is someone well known because he doesn't say anything else but the issue is there's actually four Jameses that are mentioned in the New Testament Uh, two of them were apostles there was James the son of Zebedee the brother of John uh, but he was martyred by one of the Herods in Acts chapter 12 verse 2 around AD 44 Uh, the second apostle James is the son of Alphaeus he's sometimes called James the younger I presume he was younger in age Uh, we all know not much else about him. Uh, The third James is mentioned as the father of the apostle uh, Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other Judas. But he's also rather obscure to be considered the author of this letter. But there is a fourth James uh, described in Matthew 13, Galatians 1, 19, as the brother of Jesus, the son of Joseph and Mary. Uh, The James that would have witnessed Jesus' teaching and miracles. The James that uh, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us witnessed the resurrected Christ. Uh, The James that Acts chapter 1 14 tells us was there at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell upon the believers. The James which Acts and Galatians tell us was the head of the Jerusalem church. That the James that chaired the Jerusalem council in Acts chapter 15. uh, The James that is visited by Paul at the beginning and at the end of his ministry. But it is remarkable how he introduces himself here, isn't it? Not James, leader of the church. Not James, brother of Jesus. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see what he's saying here? The way I serve God is by serving the Lord Jesus Christ. The way I treat my brother, half-brother, Jesus, is my king, my Lord, my God. That's remarkable, isn't it? Uh, if If you have a brother here today, what would it take you to be convinced that they were God? That uh, you needed to serve them as the king of your life? I think to to be convinced of such a thing would be absurd uh, if it was not true. Our Audress is laughing away here. We won't tell her brother. There is no way that James or any of us surely could be so deceived or gullible to believe that your own brother was God unless that was the case. Uh, but James is there. He's, he was there at every point in Jesus' childhood. I, I imagine it must have been rather frustrating for James, isn't it? As he's disciplined again by his mother Mary, and uh, you know Mary says to him, "Look, James, can't you just be a little bit more like Jesus? He's always perfect." And it's no wonder the Gospels tell us that Jesus' brothers struggled to believe in him at the start. Mark chapter 3, verse 21 says that his brothers thought that he was out of his mind. They thought he was insane. They wanted to seize him and take him away. But eventually, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, which James witnessed, they came to believe. James came to believe. Jesus, his brother, was God and King of the universe. Well, verse 1 tells us who James writes to. He says, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. That probably means that he's writing in the first instance to Jewish Christians. There were 12 tribes in Israel, of course. Uh, it's, It's possible that he's speaking metaphorically about the church as the whole people of God, away from their true home in heaven. Peter talks a bit like that. But dispersion here suggests a more literal meaning. The diaspora referred to Jews that were living outside of Palestine. And we saw in our Acts series in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, that after the death of uh, Stephen, there was a great persecution that broke out in the church led by the Apostle Paul, and all the Jewish Christians were, were forced to flee for their lives, scattered throughout the Roman 
empire. It is probably to these suffering Christians forced out of Jerusalem that James now writes this letter. They're displaced, they're poor, they're persecuted, they're outcast, they're suffering for their faith. And that probably explains why in this letter James shows so much warmth and concern. Uh, many times he calls them my brothers or my beloved brothers or brothers and sisters. Fourteen times he says that in just these four, five sh short chapters. See, James writes this letter as a pastor. Right? He cares for his scattered flock who are suffering because of their faith and he wants to encourage them to keep going in the Christian life. He writes a letter because he loves them, you see. And so God has given this treasure of a letter to us too because he loves us. He knows that we too are also dispersed in this world. We live in a world that is full of all kinds of trials, disease and division and distress. That They come to us at various points. We too will face mocking or trials or sicknesses or financial troubles or various problems at various points. And in the midst of our suffering, here Pastor James wants to bring us God's word with great concern and great love. But the first word is rather striking, isn't it? Uh, he wants us, first of all, this is the first point, to find joy in suffering. Joy in suffering. Look at that remarkable way he opens in verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. You could hardly think of a more emphatic way to start this letter, could you? Those words, frankly, are shocking. They are radical. They are very countercultural, isn't it? I mean, when we suffer, we normally ask, you know, where is God? Why, why is God allowing all these things to happen to me? Why me? Why now? Why this? Etc. We get angry with God. We, we get bitter with God. Aren't you meant to be loving and kind? Why are you letting all these things happen to me, especially after all I've done for you? But James says, when you face various trials, lost your job, you're struggling in your marriage, you've got a bad diagnosis, you've lost a loved one, you've failed your exam, you're lonely, you're anxious, or you're depressed, whatever it is, slander, temptation, persecution, count it all joy. It means pure joy, only joy, overwhelming joy. I mean, what could he possibly mean? What could make us feel joyful when all we feel is pain. Now, you have to understand James correctly here. James is not saying that suffering is good. He's not masochistic, as, as we might say. When God creates the world, he creates a world where there is no suffering. In the new creation Jesus is bringing us to, suffering will be no more. Suffering is not inherently good. Suffering is a result of the fall. Suffering is a result of humanity's rejection of God and being cast out of the garden. And in this fallen world, suffering is painful. And when we suffer, it's right that we shed tears. It's right that we feel grief. It's right that, it, that we feel pain. It is sad. It is difficult. It is not meant to be. James is not commanding us to be joyful because he thinks suffering is good. He's saying that we can be joyful when we recognize what suffering produces. Look what he says in verse 3. He says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, what, what James is saying here is no matter how difficult it is, no matter how, what, what we might feel, our suffering is never pointless. Suffering, we're told, tests our faith. It, it shows whether our faith is, is real, and, and it refines it. See, if you were to, to refine gold or silver, what you would do is you would heat it up uh, in a very hot fire, and, and you would burn off all the impurities. That's the idea here, uh, that, that as our faith is tested by the fiery trials, that it's refined, it's made pure, it's made stronger. Maybe if you go for an e examination, uh, as you... The testing process, it forces you to prepare for the exam, to learn the material. I mean, the, the point is this. Trials, tests, strengthen your faith. 
So if I give up following Jesus when everything gets tough, then what, well, what does that show? It shows that I, I didn't really trust God much at all. But when I'm suffering and I keep trusting in God, well, that refines my faith, doesn't it? It produces steadfastness, perseverance, makes me more like the Lord Jesus. Uh, and so he continues in verse 4, Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I, I think we understand this. Training builds up strength. Uh, I don't know about you, but I kind of hate the gym. Uh, you can probably tell that, I guess. I mean, I, I don't understand it really, the idea of uh, you know, running around and uh, lifting weights and so on. It's not really my idea of uh, relaxing. I can think of other things I would rather do. But, uh, but why do people go to the gym? It's not because it's pleasant, is it? It's because of its effects. The, the painful training produces a good result, you know, you're quite buff and six pack, all that, all that kind of thing. So with suffering. Suffering is difficult. Suffering is painful. Suffering is, is, is hard. But God, if you like, is our personal trainer, is using you know, all the, the weights of suffering to produce a six-pack faith, if you like. He's using it to teach us to love him, to trust him, to be satisfied in him, to, to, to treasure him in every single circumstance. Paul writes something similar in the book of Romans, chapter 5. He says, not only this, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. See what Paul is saying? It's the same thing, really, that we can rejoice in suffering because of what it produces. It produces endurance, it produces character, it produces hope. And that hope will be vindicated because we can look to the cross and we can know how much God loves us and we can be certain and absolutely assured that no matter what we're going through, that God still loves us and he has a good plan for us at the end. See, James understands that the result of trials is a mature faith. With time, perseverance through trials will make us perfect and complete. That's James's main concern in this letter. He wants our undivided obedience. He wants an unblemished life. He wants an unreserved commitment to God. Of course, we can't ever reach that perfection until heaven itself. But he knows that it's the trials along the way that are going to refine and purify us on the way. Uh, one of the main people responsible for me moving here to Malaysia for ministry was a man named Richard Chin. Some of you may have heard of him. He's actually Malaysian, but uh, he lived a long time in Australia. Uh, but back in December 2009, his wife, Bronwyn, was diagnosed with terminal pancreatic cancer. At the time, they had four children uh, who were under the age of 15, and, uh, at the, and she was given six months uh, to live. Uh, before she died, she wrote uh, an article entitled, I Thank God for the Gift of Cancer. This is what she writes in her article. I don't like being in pain. I don't like having terminal pancreatic cancer. I would like to grow old with my husband and see my kids grow up. She goes on, why has God given me cancer? All I know is that God has given me the gift of cancer to use for his glory. We pray daily for the cancer to miraculously go away. But if God chooses to say no, we can trust him nonetheless. She concludes her article this way. I thank God for the gift of cancer because he is good and he is using it for his purposes. The plans of the Lord are perfect, even if I don't know the reason for everything. All I know is that soon I will be with the Lord forever, because Jesus alone has saved me. Now, those are the words of a woman of God who has faced enormous sufferings beyond what many of us will ever have to. And yet she faces it with joy, with hope, with trust.
She wants to use even her cancer to serve God and love her people, love his people. And when you see someone speak like that, well, you know that their faith is real, don't you? You can see how their faith has formed their Christian character. You can see that deep dependence upon God, that deep trust in God's goodness, and that certain hope for the future. And sometimes it's only when we recognize uh, what God is, is doing in all our suffering, that in, that in the midst of tears and grief, we can count them joy. Sometimes we will never know what God is doing in our suffering. Sometimes we will only know when we arrive in heaven why God allowed all of this to happen. But if we know the purpose of it, how it refines our faith, how it molds our character, that's how we can rejoice in it. So the first point, joy in suffering. Now, James knows that this mindset is not easy to adopt. It's not very common, is it? Very often we struggle to believe that God could bring anything good out of our suffering. And so in the second point, he urges us to pray for wisdom from God, wisdom from God. Verse 5, he says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. And so if we struggle to count our suffering's joy, then James says, pray. Or he says, if you're struggling to make a godly decision that pleases God, then James says, pray. Or if he says, I, I, you, if you don't know what to do as you find that sin that you fall into again and again and again, then James says, pray. Pray to God. Pray for wisdom. There is no substitute. Unless we ask God for wisdom, we will never understand our sufferings. We will never find joy in our sufferings. We will be trapped in regret, yes, bitterness, yes, fear, anger probably, but not joy. Only wisdom from God will bring that. We need wisdom and wisdom that only God can give us. But the wonderful news here is that God wants to give us wisdom. It says in verse 5, God gives generously to all without reproach. He's picking up on that Old Testament reading from Proverbs chapter 2. Uh, if we seek wisdom with all our heart, God says he will give it to us. The word generous here is rather difficult to translate. Uh, literally, it means that God gives singularly. That is, uh, God is not double-minded. God is unwaveringly gracious. He gives without reserve. He's uncalculating. He never shows uh, favoritism. There's no, there's no uh, exceptions with God. That is, God offers his wisdom freely. He offers it generously. He offers it liberally. He offers it wholeheartedly to any who will ask him for it. He does it without reproach. He doesn't think, oh, look at all those sins that you did in the past. I'm not giving you any wisdom. You don't deserve it. No. And so if you are suffering right now, then can I urge you to pray? Pray. Pray, not just for God to take away the sufferings, but pray that God would help you to see them in a different light. Pray for wisdom to see trials the way that God does. But notice this promise of wisdom. It's only for those who ask God rightly for it. Verse 6 continues, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not, must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. That is, we must be undivided in our prayers. God is undivided in offering wisdom. We need to be undivided in our prayers. Not saying one thing with our lips, but believing another thing in our hearts. We are to pray to God with faith, that is, unwavering trust or, or confidence in him. Now, when we start to see things with our own wisdom instead of God's, then very quickly we're going to start to doubt God's goodness and love. And so you probably won't pray if that's the case. Or you'll pray, but you'll think it's pointless because God probably won't answer the prayers anyway because he's not really good to me at all. Now, praying in faith doesn't guarantee that you're always going to get what you want. So the last hundred years, there's been generations of preachers, false teachers really, who have said, name it and claim it. You know, just, just have faith. Believe it strongly enough 
and it will happen. Believe on a promotion. Believe on a house. Believe on whatever it is, being rich, married, whatever it is in your heart that you want. Have enough faith in God and God will give it to you. That's not what James means here. In fact, he writes in chapter 4, he says, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? This is not a blanket promise saying that if you believe something hard enough, then God has to give it to you. God will answer our prayers according to his will. Sometimes he will say yes. Sometimes he will say no. Sometimes he will say wait. But James's point is this. If we don't really trust God to do anything at all, then why should God bother to listen and answer our prayers? See, God wants all of our heart, not just half of our heart. Now, if you're anything like me, this is rather convicting, isn't it? Uh, it, it is very easy that, you know, to pray for that non-Christian family or relative, but you don't really believe that they're ever going to become a Christian. Or you pray that God will help you resist that sin that you're struggling with, but you don't really believe that anything's going to change. Or maybe we've been praying in our prayer meeting about our, you know, our church vision and you know, the people that we want to reach with the gospel, churches that we want to plan, but in our heart of hearts we believe it's never going to happen. You know, how could it possibly happen? James says if we're like that, we are double-minded people. Literally, we have two souls. We're caught between God and the world. We're like a ship that's been set loose on the ocean. It's tossed here and there. Uncertainty, indecision, doubt. Uh, in 2018, there was a ghost ship that turned up uh, in Myanmar. That was the ship. I wonder how they missed it. It had been abandoned nine years earlier off the coast of Taiwan. Uh, and ever since, it had just been drifting around in the middle of the ocean uh, far from where it should have been, uh, and eventually it, it washed up in Myanmar. Apparently the owner was Malaysian, and you'll be pleased to know that there were no ghosts on board the ship. It was empty. But if we, if we don't believe that God will answer our prayers, if we don't believe he's good enough to listen to us, then we're just like that abandoned ship, tossed to and fro with the waves. We're not steady at all in our faith. James wants us to be single-minded, to trust him with our whole heart, to have an unwavering faith, the kind of faith that will bring joy in suffering, even in the darkest of times. And so we're to pray for wisdom, to see things God, God's way and believe that God will give it to us. Well, as James continues, he, we see that we need to pray uh, for wisdom so that we can look on our circumstances with an eternal perspective. Third point, eternal perspective. It says in verse 9, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. Now, James' point here is not that Christians should be poor and not rich. Uh, James' point here is that whatever our physical circumstances may be, that with godly wisdom we are to look beyond our immediate circumstances and look to eternity. And, and so if we are poor, if we are marginalized, if we are struggling in our life, then what we should focus on, what we should boast about is not our poverty, it's not our lacks, but we should focus on the spiritual riches that we have in Jesus, the, the glorious eternal future that we're headed to, that the treasures in heaven that we possess that no one can take away, that one day we are going to be exalted with Jesus in his heavenly kingdom and we will be rich beyond measure. On the other hand, the temptation for the rich is to boast in their riches now and with it the status, the influence, the position, and so on. James says no. If you have godly wisdom, you will look at things differently. The rich should boast in their humiliation. That is, they should recognize their spiritual poverty before God. They should recognize that their money can't stop death, their money can't get them to heaven, and they are to remember that you can't take your money with you, and life is brief after all. Verse 11, the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flowers falls, its beauty perishes, so will the rich men fade away in the midst 
of his pursuit. Now, from time to time, I uh, buy Suman flowers, uh, perhaps not as often as I should do, uh, but sometimes I do. Because sometimes I feel in my heart that it's a rather futile exercise. You know, you buy the flowers, uh, they cost a fortune, and then three days later, they're dead and gone. And I thought, perhaps we should have bought something else, you know, a vacuum cleaner or something. <laughs> but that's life, isn't it? We understand this. Here one day, gone the next. Life is so short, isn't it? Often I, where did the last 10 years go? The last 20 years go? The last 30 years? Where did they go? I mean, it seems like yesterday, doesn't it? We need wisdom. We need an eternal perspective. We need to see it God's way and not just focus on what is in front of me in the here and now, whether I'm rich or I'm poor, whether I'm married or I'm single, whether I'm working or I'm unemployed. We can get so caught up in all the things of the here and now and forget about eternity. We need God's wisdom. So we will live differently. So that we will recognize that whatever trials we face now, they're temporary. Glory awaits. He gathers all this together in verse 12. He says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Notice there's no promise here. God's going to take away all of your trials now. On one occasion, I was explaining to someone uh, how I had this uh, uh, immune disease uh, that meant that I couldn't eat gluten. Uh, and uh, this person uh, proceeded to pronounce that uh, God had healed me. Of course, uh, you know, I'd be very glad if God wanted to do that. I know he could do that if he wanted to. I'd be very grateful. But I reminded her, because I was just about to preach this passage, that God never promises to take away our trials. In this life, our hope is not in the now. Our hope is in the future. And we can persevere in our trials, in our sufferings now, because we know this world is not all there is. There is a heavenly destination we're headed to. The rich man will pass away with his pursuits, but the one who trusts in Jesus to the end will be rewarded. There is an eternal life, a, a, a crown of life, an eternal prize to come. Now, I'm aware this morning that some of us here have, uh, are suffering. Some of us are suffering very immensely at the moment. It may be silent, maybe not many people know about it, but we are suffering. It's very helpful, I think, to remember that Pastor James writes these words in love. These are God's words to his beloved children. See what he's saying? Our sufferings are painful. They are never meaningless. They are full of grief, but they can be mixed with joy. They seem unending, but they will end one day. There is a kingdom to come, you see. There is a place where death, disease, all these things will be no more. Revelation 21 says, God will wipe the tears from our eyes. What a comfort that is, isn't it? An eternal perspective gives us real hope in the hardship. And so we need to be convinced that despite our suffering, that God is good. That God is good. That's the final point today. God's unchanging goodness. God's unchanging goodness. In verse 12, you notice that James describes trials as a test. But it's very easy to misunderstand what he means here. James is not suggesting that God is some kind of cruel or unloving God who, who puts us through trials as some kind of game, you know, who, who, who stretches us to our limits uh, as some kind of activity for his own entertainment just to see how we will turn out. No, that's not what God is like. James knows full well that very often trials are also accompanied by temptations. There are temptations to doubt 
the love and the goodness of God. There are temptations to fall into sin. You know what it's like. Like when the trials come and your whole life is falling apart in front of you, you ask God, what have I done to deserve this? Why are you doing this to me? Aren't you meant to be a loving God? Look at how angry you've made me, how bitter you've made me, how anxious all this is making me. Do you delight in this, God? I don't want to be like this, God. But you're making me like this by putting me through all this in the first place. We think like this, don't we? Maybe God is not really good. Maybe God is not really trusted, to be trusted, if he makes us suffer like this. But James says, that, friends, is a lie. That, friends, is a deception. That is a lie as old as the devil himself, who tempted Adam and Eve in the garden to doubt the goodness of God. Look how strongly he rejects the idea in verse 13. He says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. He's saying God and temptation don't mix. God never delights in sin. God is never tempted by it himself, and so why would he get pleasure from seeing other people fall into it? It just doesn't make sense. Now, sure, the Old Testament is full of examples of tests, like uh, God asking Abraham to sacrifice his only son. But unlike the devil, God doesn't test us so that we will fail and then delight in it. We've already seen why God allows these things. It's for our good, right? to, to refine our faith like he did with Abraham. And so if we're suffering and we fall into temptation, we start to, to doubt the goodness of God, it's not God's problem, you see. It's actually ours. Take the Garden of Eden, for example. Yes, God put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden, didn't he? He gave Adam and Eve the choice of whether they would listen to his word or not. But when they did eat from the tree, it wasn't God's fault, was it? Genesis makes it very clear. They ate because of their own sinful desires, because they wanted to be like God. They wanted to decide good and evil for themselves. That's why they ate. They blamed each other. They tried to blame God. Oh, it's God, you gave the woman here. It's all your fault because you created her. No. It was very clear they were to blame, and God held them responsible. Uh, Paul Tripp loves to use uh, this uh, illustration. Uh, um, yeah, I'm gonna, can I borrow this water bottle? So imagine a, a, a water bottle here, right? It's, uh, it's, it's full of water. Now, what happens if I hit the water bottle? Try it out. That worked better than I thought. <laughs> Everyone's awake already. <laughs> Why did the water come out of the bottle? Right, you want to say because I hit it, right? But that's not actually the real reason. Why did water come out of the bottle? Some of you know that because there was water in the bottle. <laughs> the point is this. You can't blame your external circumstances for your sin. You know, when you get angry or when you doubt God's goodness or when you do whatever you do, it's not because of the external circumstances that made you do it. It's because there's anger in your heart. There's sin in your heart. That's why you did it, because there's water in the bottle. One preacher says this, some of you know him, Brian King, circumstances may be the occasion for sin or even the catalyst for sin, but never the cause of sin. Circumstances may be the occasion for sin or even the catalyst for sin, but never the cause of sin. James identifies the real cause of temptation, verse 14. He says, but each person is tempted when he is lured or enticed by his own desire. The point is this. Sin is always our fault. We sin because we want to. We sin because we're attracted to it by our own disordered desires. The image here is of uh, fishing. Uh, 
if you want to catch a fish, what do you do? You put some bait on the end of the fishing rod and you try to lure the fish in. The fish is enticed by its own desires and it becomes your dinner. Why do people get scammed? I mean, yes, it's because there are wicked people who try to deceive them. But it's also very often because the scammers prey on their own desires. Oh, I wish I won the lottery or a new Apple Watch or whatever it was. What is this? Temptation is our fault. It's not God's fault. And we need to be aware of our weakness, especially when we're suffering. Uh, Thomas Akempis, he writes this in this book, The Imitation of Christ. It's actually a very famous Christian book. I'm not sure if you've read it before. He writes this. Uh, at first, uh, sin is a mere thought that comes into the mind. Then the imagination is strongly excited. Next comes a feeling of pleasure, an uprising of, of the evil passion, and at last, consent. The longer we remain slothful in resisting, the weaker we become every day. It's actually very insightful um, if you think about it. It's a recognition that we need to fight temptation early because if you don't fight it early, it will grow and it will lead you to death. Uh, that's what he says in verse 15. He says, then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. So if you're suffering, then we need to be ready for the onslaught of temptation. It is surely going to come. We need to be ready for the, the waves of bitterness and the anger. We need to be ready for the false attempts to try and cheer ourselves up, either with pornography or a shopping spree or, or overeating or whatever our comfort uh, kind of thing may be. We need to be aware of that, the self-centered desire to just turn in on myself when everything is difficult, as if a little sin here and there is justified by my difficult circumstances. See, all these things are lies. All these things are false solutions. And if you allow sin to fester like that, it will destroy your faith. It will spread like a cancer. You need to fight it early. Cut out the tumor before it kills you. So joy and trials will make you steadfast, perfect, complete. But sin will destroy your faith and lead you to death. Now, James doesn't stop there. He knows we need more than warnings. What we need to do is renew our gaze on the goodness of God. Because the fact that we go through trials and temptations, it doesn't mean God is cruel. It doesn't mean that God is evil. Rather, quite the contrary. God is unchangeably good. God is unchangeably good. Look at verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. See what James is saying? God is behind good and evil in different ways. God is sovereign over evil. When Adam and Eve sin or when we sin, it's not as if God has kind of lost control or taken by surprise or something like that. God works through evil to achieve his good purposes. So at the cross, when wicked humanity puts uh, Jesus to death, God uses it for the ultimate good. We're doing evil, God is doing good. And so God is never responsible for evil. He works good through evil. God is never the source of temptation. He is always the source of good. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. That is, God is perfectly good. He is unchangeably good. God doesn't have mood swings. God doesn't have a bad day. God never stops giving. God never stops loving. God is always good, even when we can't see it. And one commentator writes this, God's benevolence is like a light which cannot be extinguished, eclipsed, or shadowed out in any way at all. 
the light of the sun may be blocked, for example, by some material object so as to cast a shadow. Indeed, for a time in an eclipse, the direct light of the sun or moon may be shut off from the observer. Nothing like that can block God's light, interrupt the flow of his goodness, or put us in shadow so that we are out of the reach of his radiance. God is good always. And that's most clearly seen in the new birth. He's given us through Jesus. Verse 18 says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That is, through the gospel, through the word of truth, we have new birth. We're set free from that old life with all the sinful desires. We're saved from the judgment of God, and we're born again to a new life which we can now live for God's glory. We saw in the book of Leviticus that the, the first fruits was the first part of the harvest that you offered back to God in thanksgiving for his generous provision. And so James is saying, look, when you are suffering, when you are tempted to doubt the goodness of God to you, look at the cross. Look at Jesus. God didn't send you to hell. He didn't give you the punishment you deserve. God didn't stay up in heaven laughing at your punishment. He came down. Jesus hung on the cross. He took our sins. He offered us forgiveness. He adopted us into his family. And he prepared for us a heavenly home. God is unchangeably good. He is good to you. The cross assures you of that. He will be good to you always, in every situation, no matter how bad. God is unchangeably good. There is no shifting shadows. He's already perfect. Trust him. Cling to him, even in the darkness. So let's conclude. What difference does Jesus make to your suffering? Will you consider your sufferings joy? Will you turn to God in prayer? Will you trust him to work good through the pain? Will you cling to his goodness and set your hope on the life to come? Or will you turn in, focus on your own desires, be filled with bitterness, doubt God's goodness, focus on the pain of the present and forget the future, blame God, accuse him of evil. There's only one path that's going to lead you to joy, peace, and hope. The other path is a path of misery, isn't it? Which path will you take? In the end, it's only the Christian who can have true joy in their sufferings. In every other religion, People follow prophets or teachers who are dead and not coming back. But we serve the suffering king who is risen, who has conquered death and is ushering in an eternal kingdom. It is only the Christian who can count suffering joy, who can know the goodness of God in the midst of darkness. Will you trust him the brief days of your life? As we finish, maybe you are here today investigating the Christian faith. Maybe you're not yet a believer. Or maybe you've realized you've been in church but never made a personal response from the heart to Jesus. It's, there's something outside but nothing inside. What well, can I urge you this morning? Accept Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior. Know his love. Know God's goodness. Trust your life into his hands. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are unchangeably good. We thank you that you are always good, even when we suffer. That even why, though we might not understand why everything happens, that there is a purpose in it all. And we do thank you for sending your son to die for us, to assure us of your goodness, to assure us that suffering can be used for good. 
And so, Lord, help us to see your goodness and your love. Help us to cling to it, especially if we are in the midst of suffering right now. Lord, whether we have much or little in physical terms, help us to focus on what we have in Jesus. Lord, help us to glorify you as we wait in hope that Jesus returns. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.